I'm going to first of all ask Dee to give her a very, just a brief introduction, and then I'm going to start to ask her some questions, okay, to get at some of the, some of the issues that we're trying to, to discuss. Um, and then if she has a hard time with what I'm trying to ask, she'll, can you, okay, then you can help with that, okay? Well, I was born in the Netherlands, and uh, you can hear it on my accent, probably. Anyway, but when I was young, uh, we had our queen, and we loved our royal family, and then all of a sudden, next door in Germany, Hitler became to, got to power. And he wanted, to, oh, he wanted really to have the whole world. And he took Poland, he took Czechoslovakia, he took Denmark, he marched up to Norway. And uh, Spain was already pro-Nazi, and we got very scared in the Netherlands. And then we heard Hitler speak, he didn't speak, he screamed always. And he screamed in the radio, you didn't have TV then. I know that the Dutch are very scared, but they don't have to be, because they have for centuries not been in war, and I will respect, I heard it with my own deaf, no deaf ears, I will respect their neutrality. And while he was saying that, we were already marching in our country, so that was the first time that a country leader said a big fat lie, I couldn't believe it. And it had happened months before, even a couple of years already. All of a sudden, our country was covered with German maids, and they worked for very cheap, and they worked for families that they lived there and were part of the household. And they were spies, we didn't know that. And many uniforms from our army kept disappearing, and we didn't know what happened. Who steals a uniform? Anyway, so we, 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 uh, they were spies, and they told a lot of stuff to Germans, and then they marched in our country in our uniform, so our guys didn't know at whom to shoot. Anyway, we were occupied. But we had heard that Dieter had one ridiculous thing. He hated the, the, uh, the, he hated, uh, the government, and they were Nazis. And he hated the Jewish people. Nobody knows why. Later we found out part, partly maybe why, and, uh, but he hated the Jewish people. For, and, uh, I mean, how can you be a Christian and hate the Jewish people? Jesus was a Jew. So it was, and they were a Lutheran country. I never could understand it, that the Lutheran loved Jesus, and, and we couldn't understand it. But then he started to make all rules. And we Dutch are very stubborn, and we don't like rules, and especially not from the Nazis. <laughs> and then we were not allowed to talk to Jewish people. And we had so very many, because in 16 and 1700, they, they most lived in Portugal and Spain. And there they were burned, and it was Catholic, and if you were Protestant, and they all came to the Netherlands. They, the Jewish people did not go to Germany or to Austria. They know that they were very anti-Semitic. And we had loads of Jewish people. And when Hitler came to power, loads of German Jews moved over the border and came to the Netherlands. You have all heard the name of Anne Frank and her family. And so there were thousands and thousands. And we had so many. Jews, and our own population was only, we are smaller than your Rhode Island, was only eight or nine million. Anyway, it was a terrible time. They moved into our country, and we felt sorry for them. But then Hitler uh, attacked our country and occupied, and they were in the first days that Hitler took over. It was horrible. The papers were so thick, and you know it's what? obituaries all from Jewish people who had committed suicide. And that told us something, how very scared they didn't even want to take a chance. They were so scared. Anyway, that told us something. But anyway, they marched in our country and they started all their Jewish rules, in uh, all their German news on our people. And they started to persecute the Jews. I had many Jewish friends and they love education. So many are doctors and lawyers. And anyway, all of a sudden they all got letters home 
you have to leave your house. You may not take anything along. Just think for the women. You have heirlooms from your, an from your ancestors, and they were only allowed per person to take a little suitcase with a change of clothing, a fork, a knife, a spoon, and a cup, and nothing else. And that is how they had to, re and there was curfew from 11 to 6, and if we in their own eyes had been obedient, disobedient, it was from 8 to in the next morning 6. And in that time we didn't know what the Germans were doing, but all the Jews had them to report to stations and they were put in, plane, in trains and they disappeared. And nobody knew where they were going. It was sent they were going to go Poland and there they could all live together on the border of Russia. But later we knew that they were going to go to camps and being killed. Anyway, I had those Jewish friends and I, I was dating a wonderful young man. He later also was killed by the Nazis, but we were engaged. And I told him and that my friend Herman was a Jew. And Herman got such a letter that he had to report at the station. And he said, Deed, we are so scared. We don't know what they're going to do with us. And I was so furious because those Jewish people had lived since 16, 1700 in our country. They had the right to be there. And those stinkers came in and March had no right to be there and they told about our people. So I was furious. Anyway, I said to Hein, he said, Herman should not go. I said, what can we do, what can we do? He says, well, his father was principal in the country of a small Christian school. And he said, I know all the farmers. And that is how we got to, uh, to uh, bring loads of Jews to the farms outside in the Netherlands. And that is then, but, and anyway, then when we had in the end also in cities we, that we had to bring them, and people said, yeah, but there was such a shortage of food. So you had ration cards, and if you were in hiding, you couldn't go to the German offices every month to get your ration cards. So then we had to do, till that time it was not dangerous, but then we had to do attacks on the German offices where they had all the ration cards and steal the by thousands, and there was the death penalty. And then it became dangerous. But anyway, Anyway, uh, then in the end, I was arrested in the train because they were after my fiancé was arrested and he smuggled a note out of prison. Did take another name and don't, and for anything, come appear in the province of Friesland. They're everywhere looking for you and be very careful and take another name. So I took another name and I had a false paper that I was a maid because others, I, if you say a nurse or a teacher, then they can check if it was false. And the guy who made the false papers, he said, what do you like your name to be? I said, I'll take the name of the queen, Wilhelmina. So I was, <laughs> <laughs> so I was really, and I read a book by the name of Lerman. So I was really Lerman. And on that name, I was arrested. And it was so good because later I have to be a bit short because we have question and answer. And then uh, I was arrested on that name. And they, well, they had me in prison. And later when the invasion came, a concentration camp, they were everywhere looking for Diet Amon and they would have been killed. So I mean, how God is wonderful and so faithful that they looked everywhere for me and they didn't know they had me already. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that is a wonder. So it was not my time yet. And at that I was 20 to 25, and now I'm 93 and I'm still here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's wonderful. But I think, you know, it's God, it's God, it's not me. So I think we should go to the questions and answers. Indeed. You did a marvelous job of uh, keeping it so short, I thought. But uh, anyway, you're a dear. Dee, um, one of the things that I, we, we wanted to get at here tonight. Can you, can you, oh, here we go. Um, one of the things we wanted to get at tonight was um, in that time when you were, you were like 19 years old, I think, right? When, 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 you, when you began to decide to be with the resistance, is that right? When, really, when the war started a week before I had turned 20. And it lasted five years, so that were five years of my life. 
and at, when in the end they found out what I was doing. So I had to do like David, go on the run, and I was for two years on the run. And all these people, and then in the end they arrested me under my false name. But the scary thing is people always think that those months in the prison were the, were the worst. But two years on the run that you have everywhere, here and night, there and night, sometimes some weekend place, but that is nerve-wracking because whoever was taking me in was guilty. So those people ran a risk. I have always to ask how if in the curfew time, if at three at night your doorbell rang, you better, it was the Gestapo, the Geheime Staatspolizei, the, the German secret police, and they were everywhere after people. And they were horrible people, very cool, because with hearings, you know, here you have at least a judge and you have lawyers, but these were only fanatic Nazis. And their wives were mostly in Germany, so they were in the Netherlands, in France, in Norway, and they mostly had the mistress. And then if they had had a quarrel with the mistress or they had had burnt toast, then if they had, if they so-called judges, they could send, if they were in a bad mood, every day, uh, everybody who came before them to death. There was no rules. If they were in a bad mood, they just, so it was always very nerve-wracking. It is terrible to live like that. Um, indeed, w one of the questions I asked you the other day in our, in our time of interviewing um, back at your place was, uh, you know, at 19 years old or almost 20, that's, that's very young for a, for a person to have that, have that conviction, have that, where did that conviction come from that you were willing to lay down your life already at that age? When you are a Christian and you see that people are killed, well, they're totally innocent, like the Jewish people that were God's chosen people, whether they believed in Jesus, yes or no, but they are God's chosen people. You have to help. You can't sit by, and I'm so grateful because the Dutch people who, and other countries too, who did not help when the war was over and that you heard that six million were killed and you were there and you didn't do a thing. How can you live with yourself? And also now, you know, we, we live in a very, I consider a dangerous time, and God is kicked out of everything. How can we expect being blessed if we kick him out of everything? The Civil Liberties Union is full blast working. They want even to take out of the coin in God we trust. They want to kick God, and we have to stand up and I think in some places I've already heard that if people have a job and they are Christians and they speak loud, that they are being fired and you can use. So we get another time of very big danger and standing up for God. And our young people also, I, they have to be taught that God, and one thing, and I see several very young people here, we don't know what the future brings, but it will bring, but we, no, only thing, God is there, and we have to ab absolutely trust him and lean on him. And if the danger comes, you have to have a stand. And if you take a stand, that is often that you have to bring sacrifices, a job, and in some cases, it can even be the sacrifice of your life. So we don't know what's going to happen. Indeed, I know that uh, you had mentioned the recently that it's like um, I think you said only 23 percent of the of the uh, the Dutch stood, and the rest of them did not. 23 percent were resistors. Is that correct? And ex yeah, I thought because all the people I met were in the resistance, so I thought practically that the whole Netherlands, except a few percent traitors, but that everybody was really in the resistance because I met so many, or nearly all of them. And then after the war, to my very big disappointment, when they did real statistics, then they found out that 23% of the Netherlands had been actually in resistance. And there were some more, and like for instance, I was hiding at farms. Now those farmers, did not do actually a resistance work, but they risked their farm and their life by taking me. And that was fortunately 
a larger percentage, but actually resistance was only 23%. Indeed, we, one of the concerns that I think probably many of us hear here regularly and have for quite some time is in relationship to, to the church. You know, we've heard about the German church, and you know, we often have stood in amazement at how the, the German church just seemed to um, just go into conformity with, um, you know, with the, what, the, what the German leadership wanted. Uh, and uh, in America, there's many of us that are concerned about the, the sleepy condition of the church, that, that there are many, many churches where the, there isn't a warning in relationship to sin and the growing tide of godlessness in our country. What was the condition of the, chur of the church in, in your time, in your country? In the Netherlands, it was very split because our queen and that is already since 1600. We have the same royal family. They are, have always been Protestant. They went with the Reformation. And they are all crowned in a church by the grace of God. And the queen had fled the moment the war broke out with the whole, and we were crying. And we said, she is our mother. When there was floodings and was, the queen was always there. And now that we are in deep misery, she leaves us alone. We felt that the mother should stay with her children, but it turned out, and then we felt much better. She had taken the whole Congress, like you have here, the Congress, and you have the Senate, and we have the first room, the first Kamer and the Tweede Kamer, that are all our ministers, and the, and the whole bunch went to London. And that was a big consolation, because that was for us clear, Hitler was not crowned by the grace of God, but Wilhelmina was. And so we felt we owned, and she spoke over the radio to us, and at one point she even told that in Amsterdam people had to strike, that from the trains we all the Jews brought to Germany. So we followed what England said, or what the Queen said from England. And so we felt that some were very split to churches because they say, all, it says also in the Bible, you have to obey your authorities. But those authorities were so evil. And like I say, the queen was by, and crowned by the grace of God was in England. So we considered her our government and we obeyed what they said. And that was again dangerous. And but the majority, some small churches really felt, well, we have now the Germans, we have to obey them. But it were not the majority. So would would you? It certainly sounds as though that there were that there was talk amongst yourselves as a young person and and others, of course, that were that were disappointed that the church was not not stronger for you folks that were hurting in a need. Is that fair to say? Do you understand what I'm saying? Well, we were disappointed. Well, we didn't really know. But I know where I lived and where I was in hiding. In, uh, in, uh, hiding. They're the pastors mostly. But they did not. I don't believe in the separation of church and state. Because God is God over all, also over the state. And I hate to say it, but I've heard Obama twice say, we are not a Christian nation. And it makes me very unhappy, because our founding fathers, we were based and formed as America on the Bible and on Christian guys. And that is very hard now. So it's a difficult time for everybody. But I think that the atmosphere in the Netherlands, in the churches was over the whole, we can't obey this stuff, but there was not an open, really, resistance. It was all in secret, secret because it was dangerous. Could, could you could you fellowship, you know, like as with the resistance, you know, in your minority? I know you had to be quiet about who you talked to because you didn't know who was a friend or or who was an enemy. But were you able to have at least a couple people that you could you could have rich fellowship and prayer with, or did you even have to be careful with that? Well, I couldn't hear the whole thing, but it, I mean, we were Christians most in the resistance because that's what we felt that God wanted us to do. So, and the churches, 
they were, well, they could secretly speaking, even, uh, you know, you have to obey the authority as long as the authority does what God says. So those, those messages drained to us and we found. But there were also pastors who were very scared and didn't dare to say a thing. But over the whole, I think that your faith, when you're in such trouble, it grows and it becomes strong because you have nobody else to lean on. Did you largely have to keep your faith to yourself or were you able to, to pray with a, a couple of others? For myself, I knew that the only thing that I felt I had to do this work, and it was very dangerous, and I knew that it might cost my life, but you have to do what God asks, and then trust him. If you read the Old Testament, how many times that God asks dangerous things from people and difficult things. Moses was 80, I think, when he had, I always, I wrote, <laughs> I hate to say this, but I had so many Jewish people, and they were always griping about, and I wrote in my diary, in the Old Testament, they were always murmuring, and they're still murmuring. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it also in the, in the Old Testament, even you, when God gave clear instructions, how often were they? griping and that's what the consolation was that I think well they did it then and they did it because we were hiding them and they didn't like the place where they were hiding like you can pick a hotel hey this hotel is not nice <laughs> yeah yeah that is really good when you um when you went to church on Sunday was it like just a regular service like nothing was happening or did they talk about in church what was happening with the No, they couldn't do that. Okay. No, that was not. That was all in, we had an underground newspaper and in that you could, but you couldn't definitely. And I always wonder because officially German is, Germany is a Lutheran country and the Lutherans also believe in Jesus and it's God, how could they? But Hitler never used the word Jesus or God. He always has a vague word, providence. And you had to obey providence, but I think he thought that he was providence. You had to obey him. Indeed, I know that one of the areas that people are probably interested in is, uh, um, did you ever meet um, Corey Ten Boom and her sister Betsy? Would you speak to that? I met them when the invasion came. I was in a maximum security prison, and that prison was right on the coast, and it, there were over 2,000 resistance people in that prison. It was a big prison. I remember as a little girl, you passed it when you went to, I lived in The Hague, when you went to the beach, and that I asked my father when we were, what is that for a big building? And he said, there are all evil people who have done horrible things, not knowing that I would be there later. But it was a maximum security. But over the whole, you didn't talk about it, because except with the people you knew, and that you, and we prayed, of course, together. And if we did the robberies, then we went on our knees, and we asked God blessings, and then blessings on our robbery. <laughs> I don't think that now many blessings are asked when they do a robbery. <laughs> but we went first on our knees and we said, Lord, we need those ration cards. You know, Will you see that nobody gets hurt and nobody gets uh, killed. And England had dropped revolvers and weapons, so we had weapons. But if you had a weapon and they caught you, you didn't even get a trial on the spot you were shot. So it was very dangerous, but our guys did it. Indeed. And then when they had stolen hundreds and thousands of all that stuff that was from the Germans. And then, of course, they were in danger because they were in the age group that had to go for work to Germany and they had all false papers. Because if you were a pastor or a priest, you didn't have to go. And we had all falsifi <laughs> falsification papers. So all the guys I worked with were, were pastors. I worked with a very <laughs> religious group. <laughs> But I mean, before we did the robberies, we always went on our knees and we said, God, you know it, and we have to have it for the people who are in hiding and for your people, and please bless us. And for several years, every month, we had to do those robberies. 
and nobody was that God was really protecting us. He was so good. Dee, when you met when you met Corey Tenboom and her sister, it was kind of a special time for them. They they came together and they were in tears. Explain what was going on there. When that comes, when you are general, when you did the invasion, and thank God for America. And, and Patton and his army was marching up, and I was in that concentration camp. And they were so scared that we were all loaded in trains, because this was all, and we were brought to a camp close to Germany, or nearly on the German border. And we were packed in trains. And it were, I was sitting on the floor, I was 20, and I remember that we were sitting, and there was a toilet, and I was sitting on the floor, and there were, we had been standing for hours, thousands of people. And Corey and Betsy were in the same prison, but in a different cell. They hadn't seen each other for months. And while we were standing, they just moved very careful because all, there were all Gestapo around us. And in the end, they were together. So they were together put in the train. And I just happened to be put in the same plan. So I sat on the floor, and Corey and Betsy saw each other. And they were so happy. So then we were brought to the camp. But Betsy was later died in Germany because they were sent to Germany. I was just let out before that. And uh, then I kept always contact with Connie, with Corey. I have many letters from her. You have seen them, yeah. So, but really, I can only say that God was always there. And when I was in that cell, that was a small cell, and I was number five, and there was no toilet, there was a big drum that you had to pee and pour on <laughs> in the full view of the others, and, and no toilet paper or anything. Oh, it's, there can never be anything that you hear me cry. It was always <laughs> something burst then. But I mean, that uh, in that cell, it was horrible because we said, and there were all people who, there was a Jewish person who was called out. And every Tuesday night and Thursday night, that was, I was going crazy. And all of us who were sat there, because that were the evenings that they did the raids on the Jewish people. And they were brought by busloads in that prison. And then you heard all little kids screaming, mommy, 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 or daddy, or whatever. And they were all sent to the gas chambers because there is a picture that you see a nurse walk with all children. So you think that is very nice that she, no, they were brought straight, that they thought they went to a hospital or to get a vaccination shot. They were all brought to the gas chambers. Deet, you spent a little less than a year in concentration camp, or was it longer than that? How long did you spend in the, in the concentration camp? In the camp? concentration camp, in the prison, I was from May, June, July, August. And then they brought us, and oh, and then your army came close by. And it was in 44, in August. And I remember that we had hope again when we heard that America had landed. And then also a part came to the south of the Netherlands. And I was in that part. And uh, I remember that when they, I saw all of a sudden, and I was a spy at the time, I had to report everything I saw, and where I saw that they were making con uh, big things for anti-aircraft and so on. And then all of a sudden, I saw great tanks, and they had your sign on it. And I remember that I read in a forbidden paper that in Italy, more allies were killed by snipers, your allies, you know, from the troops, by snipers, than really in fighting. And I remember that I saw those tanks, and that was from the Americans, they wanted to run there, and then they had so-called surrendered. That was May 8, 45. And then uh, I saw all of a sudden under weeping willows, and there was a ditch with water, and I saw Germans, three Germans, and they fully armed, and they had daggers between their teeth, and, their, and they were slipping. And I think, oh, they are not going to surrender, because otherwise they would just come up and go to the tanks. So I, I remember that, and they had seen me, and I had seen them, 
and it was clear they were not going to surrender. They wanted to maybe still kill a lot of allies. And I ran zigzag because I thought if they shoot me in the back. So I ran to the tanks and I said, there are three a spy, there are three Germans. So the tanks, three tanks turned around and got them and put them on the front. And that was my war, <laughs> my war, <laughs> my private war that I felt so good. But so many were killed by snipers. Deed, how did, um, can you talk to us about how it was that you ultimately were released and you got your freedom? How I was released? How did you get your release, yeah? It's, God has a sense of, 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 uh, of humor also. He's faithful and he is loved, but he has a sense of humor. Because I was let out of that camp on a Saturday morning and the Allies were close by. And that concentration camp had a big, big s a gate where you were pushed in. But it also had, and that's where they brought me and another girl, I still remember her name, and she then doll. And she was 10 years married, no babies, and in the camp she found out that she was pregnant. So that was very sad, but we were let out at the same day to a little gate in the back, and there was nothing but a sand road and it had tracks from a wooden car, and it had some horse manure. So we knew that once in a while they came, and then it turned out that the farmers didn't get any fertilizing, so they kept all the poo from the cows and the horses, and they collected that, and on Saturdays they had each a special wooden cart, and then they filled that cart with the poo and the whatever, and then they brought it to the fields and spread it out. And so it was a Saturday, and we didn't know where to go, but we wanted to get away because they had been so cruel that we thought, hey, they let us out. But I'd heard a woman in German, and I had pretended that I couldn't speak German, but I'm fluent in it. And I heard her say, oh, she goes to Germany. So I thought maybe they have just let us out and pull us back and say, ha-ha, big joy, you go to Germany. So we wanted to get away. So we started walking to that little dot, and it was Saturday, and it was a car full of you know what. <laughs> And it was the fourth year of the war, and the farmers did this every Saturday, and they never scrubbed that car, so it was caked on everywhere. The, war, the farmer was walking, he didn't want to sit on it. So then when we came, and he saw it, and he said, girls, girls, you just came out of the camp. He said, yes, but it was far to the station still. This was out of the place. It was cold, anyway, it was cold. And so they said, but would you like to go hop on? I said, yeah, we did. So we hopped on on that poop car. <laughs> and you know, and it stunk. It was full of poop. And you know what, later, when I, when I went years later, I was still hiding on the farms. So often they were spreading that. And then the farmer said, hey, yuck. I said, freedom. <laughs> <laughs> So, and I still love it when I now pass, so. Do you, uh, do you know how many people were saved as a result of, of your, your obedience to the Lord? Do you know how many? Well, the person that we, with, that we actually hid that I knew face to face were over 60. But I heard, because later other groups knew that we did those robberies and had those ration cards. And then when I was free, I had to spread them because the men were always stopped. So, and it was very dangerous to have those ration cards from the robbery on you, and I had sometimes two or 300. So I had to bring them to other places. But, uh, what was your question? How, how many, uh, you, you said oh, about 60? I found the ration cards. We helped about over 60, 63 or 65. And all the ones we hid came through the war. And you know what? We put them all with Christian families. Where every day with the meals, the Bible was being read. And what do you think? Only one became a Christian. They are the most difficult to evangelize. So difficult. I support the Jews for Jesus because they do a lot of good and they bring. It's easier if an other Jew brings a Jew, but from Christians they don't take a thing. 
Did you, I know you saw so much and you had so much, obviously, heart, heartache, and it was very difficult for you to remain in your country. Tell about that, would you, and, and then why you came to America. Well, our real resistance group is for my work, and I was the only girl, we were 13, and eight were killed, and several others had been in prison like me, but we got out. And I, we had, when I was arrested, we had just taken out our wedding license, set the date, and I had my wedding dress, and he was the leader of our group, and he was killed in Dachau. And so, and so many were killed from my friends, from the 13, eight were killed, I couldn't stay in the Netherlands. So I heard that the, I said, well, I want to do something. And then I had really a business background, and, and I had seven languages, but the most Spanish. So then I started studying nursing. I thought now I have to find something else to fill my life. So I studied nursing, that was three years, and a year for maternity, and then shell oil, where my fiance worked, and where they all loved him. They had kept an eye on me. And they said, Deep, what are you going to do now? I said, I study nursing, and when I'm a nurse, I want to leave the country to live somewhere else, and they kept the eye. And then when I was nearly graduated, they called me again, and they said, come. And they said, you still always want to go outside? I said, yeah, the moment I'm this. And then they said, it's like Emily here asks you. And they said, would you be willing to go for us? So of course, that was one of the best jobs to for Shell. And they asked me to. And then they said, where do you want to go? And I said, what do you have? So they mentioned Mombasa and Indonesia. And then they said, Venezuela. I said, do they speak Spanish there? They said, yes, why do you ask? I said, I have several degrees in Spanish. Oh, we don't talk anymore. You go to Cardon. And then I was sent to a total des desert in Cardon, where they had built a small hospital. But there were oil fields, so there were young people working. And when they got a job there, they quick got married. So then they were all young couples. And then often there, the first baby came. And all the doctors spoke Spanish, and the nurses spoke Spanish. So then I, was, I worked from 7 to 5 with two hours at lunchtime when it was boiling hot. That you were free and could take a nap, but I was called out in the night so often because then when those women got their first baby, when the pain was every eight or nine hours, then the husband, she is so close, she is so, so much in pain. <laughs> and often it was the next day, but they were so scared because it, they had no mom there, and they only the doctor spoke all Spanish, so I had a wonderful time. And that's where I, in the end, met my husband. That I, I married when I was 39, because I, for 15 years I couldn't forget him. And then I married when I was 39, and I had a son at 41, and a daughter at 43. So I have both, <laughs> and it's wonderful. So, Deed, as we, as we move towards closing, and I'm going to change it up just a little bit, I'm going to have you offer some closing words and some some words of from the Lord that that you're so good at bringing scriptures and, and whatever and then I'm going to open I'm going to change I'm going to give the audience a, a, just a short time to ask a few questions like three or four okay. okay well my word is to everybody from the moment you're born till the day you die somewhere you get a heavy cross to bear because there is not one life it gets smooth from your whole life. It can be that you lose somebody, it can be other things, it can be sickness, it can be that you have family, it can be that you are suffering. But one thing, I scraped that with my bobby pen in the wall in prison, and it words, were the words from Jesus, Lo, I am with you always. And whatever happens, you are never alone and you just cling to him and he gives strength according to what you need and for i have had that i couldn't even pray anymore and that i just said lord help and he helps and he takes the smallest pray for him everything i can't imagine he has the whole world and he is now in syria and in somalia the christians are being killed 
and he still takes care of the smallest things in each in each of us life you know even if you're scared to go to the dentist or so that, yeah i mean that are little things but you can be real scared or nervous or that you have to go to the doctor and that you expect bad news but whatever happens you're never alone he is always there he promised it and he keeps his promises lo i am with you always till the end of the ages beautiful thank you we're going to ask you a few questions no, you have to help. I can't Would you. anybody like to ask a question? I, I knew that. I was here the last time that she spoke. Could she tell just the story of washing the clothes when she was <laughs> in that concentration camp? It said on my papers that I was a maid. And to be honest, my mom was home. I had an eight-year-old sister who had four years household school. You had to tell you did sewing and you did canning and everything. I hadn't even boiled a potato in my life. <laughs> But I learned it at the, fa at, the, at the thing. And also, thank God for that farm. Because I said, how can I help? They gave me shelter. She says, there was no soap, hardly any soap. A brown piece of, it looks like putty from the windows. And you had to grasp that. And that farmer said, if you can be here every three days, every three weeks, and do the laundry. Can you imagine the underwear from three weeks and the socks from the men? You could put them down and they stood. <laughs> anyway, I was, and then I, in that concentration camp, they, it said, so it said, mate. So the soldiers there, the Nazis, made me wash their underwear. Their uniforms were steamed. But I mean, I had to wash their underwear. And you had the Nazis thing, the swastika, but there was another group, and that are the fanatic volunteers, and they had this, the, the, that was a, not the swastika, but it was the, uh, the SS, and they had the letters SS embroidered here. So then we were three girls, because it was a lot of laundry, and then alone I couldn't do it, but I was the boss, because I was so-called the maid, and then... <laughs> And then the three of us, but to stand there the whole day and watch three fit prisoners washing hands in the suds, in the rinse, in the blue racket, and so on. So sometimes she locked us up and she disappeared. And the moment she disappeared, we took that undershirt with that hateful swastika, and then we got a big, nice gob of saliva. <laughs> Put. And you know, every time we could go a bit more backwards and stuff better and better. And I could now say, or then, not now anymore, but I could in the end say, do you want it on your right eye or your left eye? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. I have two questions, and these go back in your story a little bit. Number one, when you were with the resistance and had to move from place to place, did you use your own? Did you use your own name, or did you use a false name? Okay. And then the second. Nobody I worked with, we all had false names. Okay. You never used your and only your first name, and that's interesting because I had the other day to speak somewhere, and they said my father was there, and what was his name? I don't know him, and she mentioned his real name. I said, do you know his hiding name then? But, so. Okay, the second question is, you don't mention your family at all. What was your family doing when you were a 19, 20-year-old and in the resistance? My parents had uh, the Gestapo often over the floor, so I could never go home. And my parents did like I was a terrible child. <laughs> and, and when they came to ask, and they said, oh, she is so horrible. Where is she? We don't know. She is so horrible. We don't know where she is. And then in the end, they said they came back the next day. Now a girl of 20, Christian, should be home at night. You know, at that time, you just didn't disappear. So then they said, see, my father said, that's what we had to put up with her. And then they came two weeks later again. Hasn't she be home? 
No, and my father said, we don't know. And they said, do, do you know Heinz Sietzma? Oh, my father says, that is, they loved him, like their own son. And they said, that's that guy that she all the time goes with, and he may not set a foot in this house. And so that in the end, the German patted my dad's shoulder and said, I know what you're going through. I have a daughter just to say. <laughs> One more question. Also, you know, she um, Dee will be at the book table and is open for you know your questions back then as well. And in of course, it includes a lot more detail than what you're getting here. Do you see any correlation in what's happening in America right now with what happened in the Netherlands? I'm very worried. How the situation? I'm worried. I think the Civil Liberties Union is working so hard to get God out of everything. And I heard that in the public school, they may not even pray before they were allowed to pray to God. But that could be the Muslim God, but they may not even do it anymore. And they kick God out of everything at the moment. And I feel very, very worried because if we do that, and the majority says we have to stand up, because how can we ask for a blessing of God? We have to say, Lord, I mean, even for when Jesus would have come. So even for a small group who prays, God will listen. But maybe we don't know what his will is. But I think it's a very dangerous time. And we have to see that the children get a solid foundation. And many people can't afford the public school, can't afford the Christian schools. But then the public schools, they may not say the name of Jesus, but then do at home your duty. That's very important. Very good, Deed. Very good question. Um, stand there just for one minute, if you would. Um, Lisa, I'm assuming that you're on the other side listening to this. Uh, this is on uh, rehearse, but if you would bring that special presentation that we'd like to give to you, we have a little surprise for you. Mm -hmm. Jeff, would you go see if she's, I imagine she's listening on the other side. But while she's coming, would you, would you offer a, a prayer for us? Would you pray for this for us as, pe as you close? For here? this group and yes. for the country. Yes, you would, please. Faithful Father, faithful Father, you know and you see us and you hear what we say and we, we know that it's a very, you know that it's a very difficult time. Make us faithful and give that when it's needed that we stand up for you. Father, you are the only one to whom we can turn, but you are almighty and you see the whole world and you see the country here and you know what's going to happen in this country, even if they want to kick you out. Father, make us faithful that we stand up for you. And if we have to suffer, give us then the strength to do that. And most of all, Father, we ask your blessing. You see what's happening in Syria. You see all the things that we do to your beautiful creation. When you look down the six days, you said it was serious. It was so very good. What have we made out of that, Father? We ask forgiveness. Live in our hearts and make each one of us faithful where you have placed us. And before we were born or even conceived, you had already decided the good works you wanted us to do. Give that every day that we think and look for what you want us to do and that we are faithful. Live in our hearts that we are let the lights in this dark world. Father, you are the only one we can go to, and it's enough. You are enough. Will you be with all of us? You know our problems. Will you give us each one what they need, Father? And if that are difficult things, give them your strength. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dee. Lisa, would you come in? I love flowers. <laughs> 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 
wonder that you love flowers so oh, my goodness. Oh. Thank you so much, Dee.